morning in the house of the Lord. Give it up for our praise band, please. They do a great job every morning. Especially want to thank Marcus Acker for coming out and helping us out this morning. Thank you so much for coming out. Well, again, it's great to see you this morning. As summer comes to a close, I can always tell because our attendance is higher. So I want to thank y'all for coming back and being here and celebrating, uh, just coming to church and, and learning and loving Jesus more. Amen. We have a special way of, of 
greeting our new visitors. If you're a new visitor, we ask you to stay, stay seated. Members and regular attenders, get from where you are and meet the people that we've been praying for. you could please just re return back to your seats or stand where you are as we uh, pray. Father God, we just, we give you all the grace and the glory, Father. Father, we just, uh, we thank you for just uh, allowing us to come to you, Father. Father, thank you for all the things you do in our lives, Father. Father, today we pray for the message, Father. We pray for the ears and the eyes, Father, just to hear and, and see the things that we need to do in our lives, Father, to grow closer to you, Father. Father, we just lift up Pastor Joe as he's ready to look, deliver the message that you want him to deliver to us today, Father. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound.
say a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found as blind. But now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. I first believed my chains are talk about grace this morning before I get there let me just tell you about real quickly we have set the dates for our 2019 Israel trip for those who are interested in going and uh, about 50 spots we have reserved with the airlines with the hotels and probably I would say about 25 of those spots my wife and I were counting this morning have already been taken so if you want to go be sure and grab a brochure uh, from the lobby center table there are brochures out there that give you all the information you want on it uh, I just don't know what happened. All of a sudden, people just, you know, from 
I'd preached over at Mims Baptist a few times over the last couple months and mentioned we were going and all of a sudden they started putting down deposits. So I'm kind of holding off because I want you folks to have the first opportunity. Uh, so you need to get in there pretty quick before we start confirming all these uh, names that we're getting and everything. So if you are interested, I would just ask anybody that's in the church here who's been, they'll tell you if it's worth the, the value or not. I've seen some beautiful sights in my life. I've been to Swiss Alps. I've been in the Black Forest of Austria. I've been to Alaska, I've seen the glaciers and the beautiful natural landscape of those places. I've been in the Sinai Peninsula and Jordan and Egypt. And uh, I've been on a lot of places. I've been underwater a whole lot more places, I think. But uh, those scuba divers here. But there's nothing like standing in Israel, in all the world. There's nothing like standing in Jerusalem. There's nothing like being there at Temple Mount. There's nothing like standing on the Mount of Olives. There's nothing like being in the Valley of Jezreel and all those places about me. It's just, it is mind blowing. From all those who've been, can I get an amen? Amen. 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 So join us if there's any way possible. You will, it, it's just transformative. That's all I'll say. That's, that's all for the paid commercial announcements. All right. Let's get to the message today on grace. You know, there's a lot of talk about grace these days, and a lot of people have different ideas about grace, but we want to just take a quick, because this is a topic that could go on for months, a quick one-day biblical four or five-point overview of what grace is and what it means today. There's certainly been a misunderstanding about grace in this particular day and age. In fact, many people just use grace as an excuse for the way they're living their life without any disciplines or real commitments to God and to holiness in their own particular personal walk in life. So I want to get some clarity on this particular subject because when we get a hold of grace, it will transform your life in more ways than you could possibly realize. I know that in our church this week, this month, this year, we had a lot of people who are going through a lot of different issues health-wise, physically, emotionally. It just, you know, just seems, sometimes it just seems to come like floods, doesn't it not? And just been a lot of folks who have been struggling in so many different areas. So I really believe this is a timely message, but I also believe it's a doctrinally important message for the day that we're living in of just what real grace is and what it means. I would not be here today, nor would you be here today, if it were not for grace. Amen. And the grace that God gives and the grace that God shows us and transforms us within our life. I found this great definition because I've seen a lot of, in fact, I got up this morning when I was studying again, just going over my notes and I asked Siri what she thought. She had no idea what grace is, by the way. She took me to some album that was 1972 that wasn't fully appreciated and only had 149 people buy it. <laughs> I wonder how many Christians kind of refer to that kind of same nonsensical thing I've asked them about grace and what it really means. Now, I grew up in an era where we talked about grace in the church also, but they use this terminology, and maybe you're more familiar with it. Grace is unmerited favor. Well, that's kind of grace. That's a little small facet on the diamond of grace, but the diamond holds a lot more facets than just one little sparkly side. The, the, the definition of grace is, is so profound. Uh, the best definition I found of all that I, when, when I was researching, and it's this particular word from the Hebrew word, charis, so we get the word charismatic, which says it, it's, in other words, it's, it means powerful. So there's something about power that's inherent in this whole terminology of grace anyway. Is this thing on? Because it's not acting like it's on. Reset it. Here we go. One, two, three. Nope. Batteries charged regular. You're going to have to just go through it with me, all right? So bring that up. It's the enhanced Strong's lexicon definition of what grace is. It says, it is merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps, strengthens, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, and affection, and kindles them to exercise of the Christian virtues. Now, that sounds, might sound a little bit lofty, but let's break it down a little bit. First of all, we talked about, what does it do? He says it, it's, it's that holy exertion of influence. In other words, God is moving towards us, and God is exerting some sort of influence over our lives. It's, it's an important that we understand that, that grace is something that God is doing on our behalf, and it's not because we deserved it, and it's not because it is unmerited. We didn't earn it on any way, but it is a profound move of God on your life, whereby it said in that, what's that definition? By which God inserts his holy influence upon souls, turning them to Christ. In other words, you would not even come to Jesus if it had not been for God's grace. 
God's grace is what allows the Holy Spirit to convict hearts and convince them that they need to give their life to Jesus Christ. So all that issue that you dealt with in coming to Christ, and perhaps you're not there yet, you wonder what's going on, why do you keep thinking about God, why do you keep thinking how you need to get right with God, all that is grace, all right? God is moving in your heart, and God is moving in your life to bring you to a place where you can fully experience his grace. It says he, he exerts his holy influence upon him and turns us to Christ. Now, once we come to Christ, it says he, he keeps us. That's the power of God's grace to hold you close, to keep you within, his, within the bonds of his family and within the bonds of his grace. But not only is he keeping you, don't you like this definition where it says he's influencing us also to, to increase us and to strengthen us in our, in our walk of faith. So God not only convicts me and deals with me, that's grace. God only saves me, that's grace. Then God starts working in my life, that's grace. He strengthens my life, that's grace. So let's, let me just kind of break this down from, from a biblical perspective, and let's look at what the Bible definitions are for grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us that we're saved by grace. Now, how many of y'all know that, that verse, all right? You, you actually know that verse. In fact, how many know it by memory, if you can really quote that by memory, all right? For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so you may not boast, all right? So he says here, the whole way that you got saved was not on the basis of you being such a good person, all right? In fact, grace dictates the fact you're not a good person, that you need Jesus Christ. I think I've shared this illustration. We were in Ruston or Monroe, Louisiana in a crusade. And it was on a Sunday morning. We, we started the crusade that night, so we usually appear somewhere in, in the community on a Sunday morning. And so we were at, uh, I believe it was First Baptist Church, some, there's a couple thousand people there in that morning service. And I preached on the cross and the grace of God by sending Jesus to die for us on the cross. And that message gave a real accurate pre- description of the agonies and the pain and the horror uh, that, that Jesus experienced when he gave his life for us at the cross, all right? But in that, I showed that that had to happen because we're sinners, and because we're all sinners, we're all deserving death, that there's not one just person in all the earth, all right? The only person who's ever been born that is just is Jesus, all right? And because man has fallen into sin, we're all born sinners, and we need the grace of God. Because the only thing that's going to cleanse us is the sacrifice of Jesus' blood. But when I finished the sermon, we had, we had a lot of people get saved that day. A lot of people were at the altar. Glorious service. But as I was getting ready to exit, and one lady came up to me. She looked like a pretty prominently wealthy woman, the way she was dressed and carried herself. But anyway, she looked like, you know, she just, just the, all the makeup she had on was just running down her face. And she tells she'd been weeping she, I'd seen her at the altar just boohooing and pouring out her heart to God and brokenness. And she said, I just, I just need to tell you something just for a minute. I said, okay. She said, you know, all my life, I've been the best person you can imagine. I've really been a good person. She said, but today, for the first time in my life, I realized how not good I am. She said, I, I under, I've heard messages on the cross. She said, well, if Jesus had to die for me, it didn't take much of his blood because I'm a pretty good person. She said, but today I've seen just how far from God I really am and how proud and arrogant I really was, and that's not going to save me. And today I gave my life to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I accepted his gift of grace for me on the cross. I believe there's a lot of people who filled our churches that way. They think they're pretty good or they think they're good enough, but Ephesians makes it very clear that you cannot save yourself. No matter how good you are, no matter how moral you are, no matter how many churches you might join, no matter how much money you give away, you need the grace of God to do a work in your life to forgive you and to cleanse you of the issue that separates you and God, and that issue is your sin. And you come to Jesus in humility, and you experience this grace for salvation. It's not of works. Nobody's going to be walking around heaven bragging about how good they were and how they got there by their own merit. It's just not going to happen. Thank God for the grace of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the grace of God. Now, a lot of us are familiar with that aspect of it. And I would say most in this room maybe have experienced that aspect of God's grace. But that's not where it stops. The Bible says the grace of God is far more abundant and far more abounding than that. I believe God not only grace for salvation, I believe there's, there's grace for serving. We talk about this unmerited you know, favor 
Well, let me tell you what, God gives us unmerited strength, all right? We don't deserve it, but he gives it to us anyway. 2 Timothy 2, 1. You therefore, my son, do what? Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He's telling you that there's grace available in Christ Jesus. That once you come to Christ, you need to serve the Lord, you need to live for Christ, and you be what God's called you to be. So now God gives you grace for that. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, it reads like this, verses 12 and 14. I think Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful. He put, him, put me into service, even though I formerly was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. He said, listen... Thank God that he's let me serve him. Thank God that he let me. I, I don't know where you are in this whole thing about serving the Lord, all right, and being involved in ministry and being part of the kingdom work, you know. It, it's nice that you're seeking to live a godly life and be what Jesus wants you to, but there, there's an element that's so often missing in so many Christian lives. I think Gary addressed it last week, is, is that area of service, amen? People just aren't serving in the body of Christ where they ought to be serving. And there's always excuses. I mean, we, we somehow feel that we're not adequate or maybe we're not trained or we don't think we're strong enough or we don't have the courage or, or the personality. Well, let me tell you, that's all true. That's all true. You don't. And neither do I. In fact, Paul says, I was, an, I was a violent aggressor against the gospel. I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor of the church. But God, God allowed me to serve and has given me grace so what do you need to serve the Lord? Not your wit, not your temperament, not your personality, and certainly not that charm, though you have much of it, I'm sure. But what you need is the grace of God. That's what's required. And he says that Jesus Christ gives us more, I love the way he put it, more than abundant. It comes not only with abundance, it comes with faith and with love. They're found where? In Jesus Christ. You can serve the Lord. There's no reason for you not to serve the Lord. All right? We have excuses, but that's all they are. They're just, they're just excuses. You can serve the Lord. You can be used by God. You can find a place to ex exercise your gifts for the glory of God, and there's really no excuse you, you can come up with because God said, you'll make yourself available to me. I'll give you that grace. I will exert that supernatural influence upon your life so that you can abound in that, and you'll be able to serve me the way that will bring glory and honor to me. That's the grace of God, is it not? Listen, I, I couldn't be here doing what I do in all the years of ministry that I've done, without the grace of God. I would have never gotten this far without the grace of God. Just his, his, his ability and leadership skills and talent or communication, then forget it. It's not going to work for anybody. We need the grace of God. And even if I do succeed on some level in my own energy or my own personality or my own strength, it is worth nothing. It is rubbish according to the scripture. It is, it, is, it is rubble. What we need is the grace of God. And when we start walking in it, believing, receiving, exercising the grace of God, it's amazing what you will accomplish for the glory of God as you walk in the grace of God. But now there's another element of grace that I think follows within even that definition. He says, therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. I believe God gives us this supernatural grace in time of need for succeeding, for sufficiency. And by succeeding, I mean that whatever we're in, we're going to get through it. Whatever we're facing, we're going to overcome it. Whatever we're dealing with, we're going to be the victors in it. That's the grace of God. That, that's the true definition of success, I believe, when we experience the grace of God so that we are able to do what God has called us to do and complete it adequately, no matter what may be in our way, no matter what problem we may face, no matter what weakness we may have to deal with, no matter what distress, no matter what sin we have to face, that God has given us grace to make us sufficient for every situation that we will ever face. Many of you in this room, if not all of you, we get honest and get, re get real about our weakness. But not a one of us can say, I don't have a weakness or I don't have a problem or I don't have an issue. My goodness, uh, like I said at the beginning of the message, some of you are going through some serious issues right now. You know, and they're on the prayer list and we're believing God and we're, some of them are physical and mental and emotional and spiritual. <clears throat> Listen, God is sufficient for all these things. So how are we going to get through it? Grace. 
amazing grace. God's grace, his influence, that powerful influence upon your life to be sufficient in your life. There's the passage on the board, 2 Corinthians, that's, that's verse 9. But let me read all that little bit of passage. It starts like this. Because, he, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, this is the Apostle Paul, saying, God's blessed me with this mysteries of the gospel. For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me and to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, what? This problem, <laughs> this thorn, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. Some of you are thinking, I've implored the Lord a thousand times that it might leave me. I've implored the Lord. Now catch this. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. I have a weakness. I have a problem. I have an issue. Now, here it doesn't tell us exactly what Paul's talking about. He said, there's this thorn in my flesh, right? There's a thorn in my flesh. What is it? He doesn't tell us. It's in his flesh. He said it was a messenger of Satan that was sent to buffet him so that he wouldn't get arrogant about all that God's been doing with him and how God has blessed him with all these revelations and has allowed him to do ministry. He said to keep me in a humble state, the Lord allowed Satan to do this thing. And I asked God, don't do it, please. <laughs> get rid of it, please. Take it away. Isn't that most of our prayer every time we face a dilemma in our life? Oh, God, I don't want to go through this. I don't want to deal with this. How many of you are right in the smack dab middle of something right now? You think, oh, God, get rid of this. Can I get more amens than that? <laughs> Amen. Don't we get there? But we need to pay attention. Maybe God's speaking to us these same words. My grace is going to carry you through this. My grace, through my grace, you're going to succeed in the middle of this. Through my grace, you're going to find all you need to find in, the, in what you're dealing with. That on the other side of this, you're going to see the glory of God. But my grace is going to carry you. And even better than seeing the result, the glory, the finished product, is the fact that you get to experience my power right now. So Paul said, I'd rather get be here and experience the power of God than to be out of this issue and not get to experience the power of God. And that might not make a lot of sense to you unless you've experienced the glory and the grace and the power of God. But when you come to the place, you realize that all my Issues and all my problems are in his hands. Listen, I remember early on in God dealing with me in, in this whole issue, first about being saved and then getting saved, was the first issue of, okay, thank you that you died for my sin, but I can't live that kind of life. It's just not going to work for me. That's not who I am. I'm not going to play games, I, so I keep resisting. And finally, I get to the place where I'm just miserable in my life. I say, okay, I give up. <laughs> Save me, Lord, by grace. Changed my life, come into my heart, and he did. But then he began to show me that I was going to be able to live it, and I was going to be able to escape these things that had such tentacles, for lack of better terminology, hooks in me, that I would be able to break free or live free. Even in the midst of the conflict, he'd give me freedom and he'd give me grace. I see, this is where a lot of church members fail to realize that it may be a besetting sin they're dealing with. It may be an addiction. It may be, I don't know. It may be some distress or, and sickness even that you might be going through. But understand, it's the same no matter what the weakness might be. God's grace is readily available and will get you through and get you in and over and up through all of it in the midst of all of it, no matter what happens to it. You'll experience the grace of God, the freedom of God, the victory of God, and the glory of God. When you look at this thorn, that's a whole other sermon we'll deal with some other time. But first, remember, it was sent for a very specific reason to keep him from becoming arrogant and to keep him from becoming proud, which we all have a tendency to move towards. Amen? I have, you have it. I have it. A tendency to arrogance. And so the Lord will allow things in our life to keep us needing Jesus. Or at least keep, we need Jesus anyway. Help us to realize we need Jesus. Maybe I'll put it that way. It helps us understand that this life, this world that is so beaten down by sin and oppressed by demons and by satanic forces, we're living in it and it's a real world. And the only way we're going to get through 
as light in all this darkness is to keep holding on to the cross and to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we hold on, amen? We bear through. It could be, as I said, it, 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 whatever it is, and we could go through a thousand illustrations, but understand whatever it is that is there in your life on any level, you can believe God that he's sufficient for the situation. So here it is, it's in his life. It's helping from being becoming full of pride. It's there, obviously, God allowed it to happen. He said it was a messenger of Satan that God allowed, all right? Ultimately, you have to realize that all the devil can do is what God would allow him to do in your life anyway. Unless you start allowing him a little bit more room, then you're in big trouble, amen? But it's sent to keep him humble. He said, it, 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 was, it was a means to buffet me, is what he said. To, why? Because sometimes we need a slap, a wake-up call. All right? Not necessarily physically, but it might be physically. But sometimes we just need a wake-up call from God to realize that this thing about Christian life, living, it's something that requires Christ at all times. I'm not going to ever be able in my Christian life to say, okay, Jesus, you've done a real good job so far. Why don't you take a rest? I'm going to do the rest of it without you. Is that going to happen? No. There's never any time. I have discovered in my weakness that I can get that far away that far away, one little silly centimeter away from the cross of Jesus, and I will mess up royally. Seriously, I know, I know it's hard for you to believe. Okay. <laughs> Ask Kathy, she knows. <laughs> but you're the same. There's nowhere you get to coasting, all right, in your Christian life. There's no way you say, I got this. No, you don't. He's got this. And you have to keep trusting him in that regard in every part of it. He said, this thing was sent to buffet me. And by the way, that word buffet is the same word that's used to describe the crucifixion process of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? And so you follow it through. One thing, last point of that. Praying didn't make it go away. But praying got the answer that he needed. If you're listening, praying came, got him to the place where he heard God speak he spent time with God, and God said, I'm going I'm to give you the grace you need for this. That, what was that definition? That effectual working in our soul that we need. God's going to do that. So you had the promise that God's grace brings sufficiency in all things. Let me show you this verse. Uh, well, I don't have it in the Amplified. Let me come back. Those, those are the four observations I just spoke about, by the way. All right? Let me, let me just read you this verse from the Amplified New Testament. And you know the Amplified just amplifies the basic Greek definitions of these words. So it's... In 2 Corinthians verses 12, 7 through 9, it reads this way. And to keep me from being puffed up and too much elated by the exceeding greatness or the, the preeminence of these revelations, there was given me a splinter, a thorn in a flesh, a messenger of Satan to rack and buffet and harass me, to keep me from being excessively exalted. Three times I called upon the Lord, and I besought him about this and begged that it might depart from me. But he said to me, my grace my favor, my loving kindness, my mercy is enough for you. It's sufficient against the danger. It will enable you to bear the trouble manfully. For my strength and my power are made perfect, fulfilled, and completed, and show themselves most effective in your weakness. Listen to these words. Therefore, I will all the more gladly glory in my weakness and my infirmities that the strength and the power of Christ, the Messiah, may rest. Yes, it will pitch a tent over and dwell upon me. The grace of God. Well, that's terminology that's not popular in the modern prosperity church, that, that we would have to go through situations that God would allow something that would literally buffet us to bring us to our knees, to call upon him, to seek his power and grace in our lives. God never gave us a promise that he remove us from all the dilemmas. I mean, how many times do you read in Scripture where God healed somebody, and then you read a bunch where God didn't heal somebody? I mean, Philip talked about, and Paul talked about leaving someone in, at Miletus, and they were sick. Excuse me, Paul, I thought you healed people even with your shadow going by. <laughs> you know? He tells Timothy, you're having trouble with your stomach, so drink a little wine for that problem that you're facing with your stomach. I mean, you see it over and over. There's times when the Lord doesn't heal, but I'll tell you what the Lord does do in every situation. He gives you grace. He'll give you what you need to effectively walk through it in his power and to recognize that the fellowship that you experience with him is real and it's genuine. In fact, I think when Paul says, therefore, I will most gladly glory or rejoice in my problems, is the fact he's saying, that's where I meet God the most. How about you? Has that really been true in your life? 
It's been in the darker times, the harder times, the more difficult times that you discovered the power and the glory of God the most in your life. But all too often we miss that because we don't think we can be free or we don't think we can be delivered or we don't think we can go there. Or we don't think we can speak up or we don't think we can be bold. Whatever it might be, there's grace for all these things in our life. There's, and it's, it's sufficient grace. It's the grace of God. But catch this. There's one other element of grace I want to show you today. And, of course, there's many, but I will stop with this one. I just read that. Grace reveals to us the will of God. It instructs us. It shows us. Listen, he says, he says in Titus 2, 11 and 12, the grace of God has appeared and brings salvation to all men. What else does the grace do? The grace of God also has appeared to teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to teach us to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. So the grace of God, he says, not only does it set us free in Christ, it gives us insight. It gives us instruction. He uses this Greek word padeo, and it, it means to instruct someone or to teach someone, to disciple someone, to train someone. And he says, that, he lists about five things here. He says, first of all, it teaches us, what's it teaches? That we should deny ungodliness. All right? What's grace teach? You know, what we have today is a lot of people who are just living ungodly lives, and they excuse it by saying, well, I'm under grace. <laughs> Apparently, they didn't get the message. <laughs> We don't use grace to excuse our ungodly behavior. He says the grace of God teaches us to renounce ungodliness. So if we're really under grace, we're saying, I don't want to be an ungodly individual. You say, well, what is ungodliness? We'll put it simple. Anything's not like God. <laughs> you have a decision to make this week, this month, big decision? Here's the first question. The grace of God will instruct you in the way you should go, I believe. Is this like God or not? If it's not like God, grace shows you right away. Stay away from that deal. If God's not upon that, if God's not going to bless that, if, if there's something wrong with it, if there's something in, in, wrong with the morality of it, the character of it, if there's something inherently wrong, then it's not something you as a Christian need to participate because the grace of God teaches you to turn away from ungodliness. But he also says to reject worldly desires. Now, this word worldly has to do with the uh, epithumia. James uses this word several times. He talks about, you know, Satan comes to tempt us and draw us away by the lust of our flesh. It's that word, the desires. Now, about 31 times it's translated in the King James Bible as the word lust, all right? But we think in our English language just mostly of, in, in the context of a physical lust, all right? But he's talking about all desires, not just that desire. All desires that are in us that are ungodly, and are worldly, things that just don't come to grips with, with, with God's way and God's will and God's word. Yes, it could be immorality. You know, it could be pornography. It could be things like adultery. You know, you say, well, I'm thinking about having a relationship with somebody else, not my wife, my husband. Hey, God's grace shows you not to do that, all right? And you can't go do it and say, well, I'm under grace. It doesn't work that way. That's a contradiction to the, to the Scripture and to the Word of God. So here it talks about craving after something. It could be addictions. I'm addicted to this. Uh, it could be, it could, I mean, there'd be in kind of addictions, wouldn't you agree? But you're, you're craving after that, and you know it's worldly, and you know it's not God's will, and you know what it, it's not what God wants, and God said, all right, you know that, then sh step away from it. I don't think I can because I am addicted. But he said grace will provide freedom. Grace will provide deliverance. What if I have to go through a withdrawal? What if I go see pink elephants for a month or two? Just go, tell them about Jesus when they come up. <laughs> you may have to suffer in choosing the will of God. The Bible talks about suffering for righteousness' sake. All right? Yeah, there may be, there may be an addiction to food that you need to break. Best way, obviously, would be a fast. I don't think I can do it. Grace will enable you to do it. It could be an addiction to always responding to people on a negative level. You can break that addiction through the grace of God. So whatever it is, whatever is worldly, whatever falls in that category, he says grace is teaching you how to deal with it. He says not only that, I love this, grace teaches you how to live sensibly. It's the word sober-minded. It's that word sober, and we've talked about it before. It learns to think correctly is what it all has to do with. Quit thinking like everybody else thinks. We call that stinking thinking, you know. Start thinking like God thinks. Think, if you want to know what to think on, think on these things the Bible says. Whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, whatever is just, whatever is a good report, these are the things that we think on. 
Now, what we need to do is learn how to change our thought patterns and our thought life is what the Bible says, and grace will allow that to happen if we're willing to make that kind of decision. And this has a lot to do, again, back with the will of God. And by the way, these simple lessons, these three or four things, if you really want to know about the will of God in some regard, you start here, it'll, it'll set the path for really discovering what God's will is. In fact, in October, I'll be doing a seven, eight-week study that we'll also be using in our lift group on discovering God's will and how to discover your destiny that is in this realm of grace that we're talking about and how to experience the fullness of God in your life in that regard. But it starts here. you got to say, I'm not going to be, the sober-minded means it has to do with safe thinking. I'm not going to think like the rest of the world. Just because they're doing it doesn't mean I'm going to do it. Just because they think it, I'm not going to think it. I want to see what God wants. So it teaches us there's some things we don't do, and there's some things we do. We live sensibly. We live righteously. All right? And he says, not only we live righteously, we live godly. Righteously and godly. That's our relationship to God. That's our relationship to the world. That we walk right. We live right. We, li we act right. We speak right. Because God's grace gives us the capacity to do that. When he talks about living righteously, that deals with your actions. This outward life you're living in the world. When it talks about living godly, that, that has to do ultimately with, with having a heart that is completely committed to God, ultimately. That I'm really genuinely surrendered. Francis Schaeffer wrote back in the 70s uh, a, a book on, uh, on, on the age that we're living in, and he called it, this is the age of, terminology was false pietism. I think I brought this up before. He said false pietism, this is my basic description of what he said in the book, is that it's thinking that we please God because we go to church or that we're pleasing to God because we're nice to people, or we gave money, or we did something in a, in, in a nice way, you know, and we were religious, perhaps, he said, and we count that as righteousness. He said, that's false pietism, all right? What we genuinely need is real pietism, real humility towards God, and really learning to say, God, you are my all in all. I love you with all my heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, and I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'm here to honor you and to serve you in my life. True pietism. Is it... We get up in the church and we tell people to live righteous life, right? We tell you to read your Bible. You need to be reading your Bible. Okay, amen. And then we tell them, you need to pray. Everybody pray. You need, you need to set a time where you can really meet with God and you need to pray. And by the way, you also, according to Scripture, you should be sharing your faith. You should be bold in, in, in your walk with God. And by the way, you also should be coming to church. You need to be a part of the body of Christ. Now, all these things are true, but here's what calculates in people's thinking. Okay, praise the Lord. We get our checklist out. I went to church. I read my Bible. I prayed my prayer. I wasn't much Bible, wasn't much prayer, but I did it. All right. And I even passed the gospel track out. So I'm right with God. That's false pietism. Somehow you've moved away from grace and you've moved into the realm of works. All right. And it's, it's like uh, walking a tightrope. You're thinking you got to get every step just right and you got to get that one foot just right out before the other, and it's got to just work perfectly. But the problem is, all your focus is on you. you. Say, well, Brother Joe, aren't you supposed to? Yeah, you do these things. But I don't do them because they make me right with God. Grace makes me right with God. And I do them because I want to be closer to God. I want to know how to hear God. I want to know what God's will is. I want to know what God's ways are. So I participate as a disciple of following him and serving him and loving him. But that's not what makes me right with him. His grace is what brings me into right relationship with him. That's the glory of God's grace. And I enjoy more grace, abundant grace, the more I'm drawing close to him, the more humbly I walk with him. So the beautiful thing, again here, is that the grace of God, when we understand it, gives us direction. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in this particular verse. You know, he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove in vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me and in me. You see what I'm saying there? That's what I'm talking about. It was, he said, I did it, but I didn't do it. It was God's grace that allowed me to do it because I couldn't do it without God's grace. He says, I just am what I am because God's grace. You know what we think? I am what I am because I went to church. I am what I am because I'm a deacon. I am what I am because I'm a preacher. I am what I am because I've taught a Bible lesson. I am, and we got this list. You are what you are by the grace of God. All right, just God's grace. That's what Paul just said. I just thank God that he counted me faithful. Even though all these things were against me, all these things I had done, 
God just showed grace on me and allowed me to participate in that grace and enjoy my walk with God. So we see that grace is not an excuse to go sin. It provides just the other thing. It's God empowering us to live in his glory. You say, Brother Joe, I I need to be a recipient of grace because I fit the bill on some of that stuff you talked about today. I am in a situation. I am facing a problem. I do have an issue. It might be sin. It might be some kind of desperate physical condition you're facing. It may be within your marriage. It may be emotionally. It may be an addictive thing like we talked about. But you've got to understand that God is not dead. Let me say it again. God is not dead. He is alive and well. And he is still moving powerfully within the heart of those children of his who will allow him and who will humbly come to him. God is still alive and well. All too often we just bail out and say, Brother Joe, I don't want to be, as Paul says, he was a recipient of the grace of God. How do I walk and receive that grace? One is just humble yourself before God. Humble yourself before God. Now that doesn't mean, oh God, I'm so bad, I'm no good. No, it means I'm throwing myself in the mercy of God. I need you. It's more about him than it's about me, all right? It's about him. I need you. I can't do this. I can't face this. I can't deal with this. I'm tired. I'm wore out. I'm broken. I'm stressed. I'm upset. I'm frustrated. And I just can't go any further. That's humility. It doesn't come and say, well, God, tell me what I should do. And if I like it, I'll do it. If I don't like it, I don't know if I will. (laughs) That's not humility. Humble yourself before God. And be willing, if God does point to something in your life, that you're willing to say, yes, Lord. I mean, if it was just you and me here today, and I were Jesus and you were you, all right? You know, and I would say something to you, okay, I hear you, man. I hear what you're saying, lady. And you know I love you. And you know my grace is completely available to you. But you know as well as I do, as long as you hold on to, I'll let you fill the blank in. You know my grace is not going to work on you. Now, the thing about it, I don't have to make that list because the Holy Spirit's already made it in your heart before you ever got here today. (laughs) He knows how to speak what it is to us. Sometimes it's just your unbelief. Sometimes it's some sin. Sometimes it's just, you know, some failure. Whatever it might be that you've come up with. But whatever it is, that's what we're talking about. Lay that on the altar today. Give that to God. Give that to God. Start there. Because if you're not believing him, it might not be some radical, rebellious sin. You know, but if you're not believing him, the Bible says, watch whatever is not of faith is sin. If I'm not giving that Lord and trusting the Lord with that, then it just needs to be confessed to the Lord. I haven't yielded this. I haven't trusted you. I haven't given this to you completely. And I want to give it to you now. And at the same time, there has to be this commitment to understanding my grace is sufficient. God, you said your grace is sufficient. And I'm confessing that right here now. Just as much as I confess my sin, I'm confessing your grace. That you're sufficient for all these things. And you're going to meet me here today, Lord God. You're going to meet me here. And you're going to address this thing in my life. And I'm going to discover the sufficiency of your grace. The last thing is, you walk out of here today believing. You walk out of here trusting. You walk out of here holding on to God now. And as soon as Satan comes and tries to buffet you again and bother you about it and tell you it's not going to work or it's not going to work out, it's not going to happen, it's never going to be taken care of, you tell him he's a liar in Jesus, then get out of your face that you're believing God. And then you will see the grace of God manifest in your life. It's not a feeling. There's an extreme peace. It's not emotional. It can be, but it's not what it is. It's a matter of confidence in your heart. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive help in time of need. Folks, if you're in time of need today, God has grace available. Let's stand together. Father, we know that you've told us clearly in in Scripture You're available. 
Father, when we get honest, we realize that you initiated this whole process in our life anyway. I thank you for your grace and your sufficiency. I thank you that you're more than able to meet the heart's need today of any or every one of us you can meet this need. So I ask you by the power that is in the name of Jesus and the precious blood of the Lamb and the power of your promises that as we open our hearts and minds to you today, that you would move mightily, supernaturally, that which cannot be explained by others, by men. God, we give you the platform in our hearts. Today, if you're here without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God's grace is available for changing your life and saving you. He literally, supernaturally will reach into your heart, forgive you of every sin, and make you a new person, and give you the strength that you need to live the kind of life we've been talking about. That's grace. That's not religion. That's grace. Would you trust God for his grace today? There are men in this altar today. You come to anyone and say, I want to give my life to Christ. We'll gladly rejoice with you in your decision for giving your heart and your life to Christ. Surrender. Let him be the Lord of your life today. If you're a Christian, this sermon spoke right to where you are today. I'd encourage you to come acknowledge that. Somewhere in this altar, just between you and the Lord, maybe you have someone you want to pray with you, you come, find a place in the altar place, turn over the Lord and receive what he's given you and address what he's addressed to you about, what he's spoken to your heart. Speak it back to him. Confess respond, obey. If there's some of you need, you want one of us to pray with you about, we are more than willing to lift that up to the Lord. But this is a day of grace. It's not tomorrow, it's now, it's today. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Put it on the altar before the Lord. I can't help but believe this altar should be full today when we really get open and honest with the Lord. Would you come as we worship the Lord? You step out and trust the Lord with us today. Come. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, amazing love, now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to for a church home you've been praying about what the lord would have you serve him he's directing you to believers fellowship you know we stand ready to receive you today praise the lord for your participation this invitation is also open for you if you feel led to come today and be a part of the believers fellowship but whatever the need is let's reach to the holy spirit you come let's continue to worship how sweet the sound, amazing love, now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to Because 
Enable us and take care of us on every level. And Father, even if we're not delivered of what we think we need to be delivered, your grace is in the midst of it to carry us through. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. You met him in the fire, Lord. You got glory out of it. May you get glory from our life where we are. May you be glorified on every level. In Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Say it a little. Amen. That is certainly a topic we could spend months upon, but we got enough to get going, amen? So trust in, in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So glad that you're here today and I'm part of our worship service. I know Gary's gonna come just a second and share some things. Just wanna remind you about the Israel trip, again, because it's important we get going on that pretty quick. It is, it's one of those things, for whatever reason, it is filling up fast. And I know the main reason is that people are wanting to go to Israel, are seeing the price of the trips to go to Israel, and I priced them myself after working with our agents that we work with over there, who we've been working with a long time. It's kind of like the trip we just took back last year. It came anywhere from $500 to $1,000 a person cheaper. This one's showing up the same way. Uh, you know, but I think the closest one we had was about four or $500 over the cost of this one. That's the closest one I found to the price. And so it's not that we take anything out. This we just Many people who do these trips, they do them for the purpose of making money. All right. They do it to raise money for the church. They do it to raise money for ministries, whatever it might be. We do it because we want people to go to Israel and experience that in their life because it is a life changing, transformative moment for believers to be able to experience that journey. So if this is a season that you think the Lord might have you go, grab a brochure. And if it looks like you're going to go after reading it, then get to get, make, at least make the deposit. You can do that by the office or do it online and make a deposit. Uh, August the 27th, for those who just want to come in here and know more about it, that's a Monday night. We'll have a meeting here. I'll be here. Dr. Autry is going to be going on this trip with us. He's been here before, preached to you guys before, been in our men's retreats and our marriage retreats. He's, he's going to be in that meeting as well. So we'll be taking questions and giving answers for those who are interested in going and giving the details of the trip itself. Amen. So praise the Lord. God bless you. Brother Gary, you come. Amen. And thank God for Brother Gary, by the way. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. Checks in the mail. Um, don't forget your tithes and offering uh, as we worship the Lord. That is an act of worship as well. So please remember your your offer, your tithes and offering. At this time, I think Jordan, you're going to come up and, and give a quick message, uh, recap of kids camp. Kids camp. Okay. Kids camp was great. Um, Man, Satan didn't want us to go this year. Uh, on the way there, we had two vehicles break down. On the way back, we had a flat tire. And worst of all, I hit a pole. So, um, um, but no, it was great. Uh, whether we got there in uh, four hours like we were supposed to or nine hours like we did, we still got there. 
It was a great time. Um, uh, it was great just to watch the kids have fun and learn about Jesus. And uh, thank you to those who gave and were allow allowed more kids to go. Uh, because of that, we had eight salvations this year and three recommitments. And on top of that, Crystal, you have th uh, four more youth going tomorrow. So, uh, so it was a great time, and I, I hope we get more next year. Thank you, guys. Amen. Youth camp. Youth camp starts tomorrow. Youth, you need to be here at 9 a.m. Don't forget your waivers. If you have not already turned them in, they will be returning Friday at 3, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. If you have not signed your waivers, please sure to get with Crystal so that you can get those. This Friday and Saturday, we have just an awesome opportunity to, to minister to our community. Uh, it's, our, uh, it's our kids clothing drive distribution day. I'm sorry, distribution day. It's Saturday from 10, to, 10 in the morning to 1 in the afternoon. There will be early shopping available for members, family members, or church members and immediate family from 5 to 7 on Friday. If you have not been, I tell you what, we have some, some members in here that are truly the hands and feet of, of Jesus. And, and they work. It's not a one-week, two-week deal. They work every day, every week. They're here. And they're gathering clothes. They're, they're sorting clothes. They're finding out whether the gen, gently used ones, which ones are for sale, which ones they're going to put out for distribution. And they are just doing what God has called them to do. And so please come out and support them. Uh, if nothing else, it gives you an opportunity to talk to people in our community because they're not, not everybody that comes between 10 and 1 on Saturday are church members. And so they're not only coming to, to clothe their kids, they're also coming to hear the word. So if you haven't had the opportunity to come, please come and just be a blessing to, to families of our community. Uh, get plugged in. We need volunteers. Uh, but you've heard Pastor Matt talk about how he needs Awana teachers, he needs Sunday school teachers, youth, the, we need youth uh, leaders, we need people in every area of ministry, and so just to start praying about that, how God would use you in our church. We do have our food pantry, don't forget to stop by the kitchen for bread and desserts. Uh, for our guests, when you came in, you should have received a connection card, I'd ask that you fill that out if you have not done so already, that's all right. If you, when you walk out to the right, we have our welcome center, our, uh, our pastor would Love the opportunity to shake your hand, put some free information in, in your hands. Uh, I think you're getting a mug today and maybe some other uh, information about our church. But please go by there and, 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 and visit with him for a couple of minutes. Church members, I know we all love, love our guests, but please allow them to go see Pastor Joe. And then you can invite them to Lyft. But as you leave, our Lyft leaders are out there. They'd love the opportunity to visit with you. Uh, rest of the slides are up there. Don't forget we have uh, kids and youth and Lyft tonight. You are dismissed. Thank you.